our um, current presenter, I just want to remind you that our next uh, seminar is uh, Maggie Chen from George Washington University. Uh, her talk is entitled Foreign Powers and Trademark Protection in Shanghai's Concession Era. And that is on um, Friday, April 9th at noon. I uh, hope you'll be able to join us then. Uh, today, we have Dr. Isabella Alcaniz. She's an associate professor um, at the uh, University of Maryland, and she's also the associate chair of the Department of Government and Politics. She's a 2020-2021 uh, Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement faculty fellow. She received her PhD from the Department of Political Science at Northwestern University, and she studies the politics of climate change, social inequality, disaster policy, and gender with a focus on Latin America and Latinx res residents of the United States. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Alcaniz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I think you're delighted. muted, we can't hear you. Oh, really? Hold on. I don't see it. I can hear you, you're not muted. You're okay. good. Yeah, I thought I wasn't. Um, can, can the rest hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I was saying I'm delighted to be here. I wish we could be in person. Um, uh, soon enough, let's hope. Um, but uh, I'm I'm really appreciative for any feedback on this paper. Um, you can see that it's a collaborative effort with uh, a colleague at University of Maryland College Park, um, and then also a colleague at Cal State LA, um, and then Texas A&M University of Galveston. And it's a really nice um, uh, group of of scholars who we each bring. Kind of different um, areas of expertise. So there was a division of labor here, um, but uh, I've been presenting. I'm kind of the presenter of the paper, and we've we submitted it to a journal. Um, we uh, we were so lucky to get uh, was it five or six reviewers? I kid you not. Like that number of reviews. And shockingly, they did not agree on what they hated most on the paper. In any case, rejection. Um, and we're trying to figure out what to do uh, to resend. So all feedback, welcome. Um, we, we are particularly interested, or this is where I think we're, we're kind of struggling the most because we have we have a lot, it's a, it's a paper with a lot of uh, data. We have a lot of survey data. Um, we struggle a little bit and kind of narrowing it down and, and like getting what, what, what should be the major, the major theme or the major punchline. Um, the paper, you can see the title, American or not American, the role of race, immigration and partisanship in shaping attitudes about disaster assistance in the United States, quite a mouthful of a title, uh, but very descriptive of, of what we're interested in exploring here. Um, the motivation very quickly, and then I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more at length about that throughout my presentation, is what we see happening. Climate change is, um, is increasing the number and the magnitude of natural disasters. And so we see politics around natural disasters and, and disaster assistance. Uh, we see that um, old, old prejudice and attitudes towards others is going to shape um, how uh, people view victims of, um, of natural disasters. We see that the uh, disaster assistance has become increasingly politicized. Um, especially at higher levels of, of, you know, political elite. And so here we're interested in, um, in mass attitudes um, on um, deservingness in disaster assistance. And we pick up this question of deservingness um, because we see it as an increasingly salient uh, sometimes unspoken, but still their question of American politics and also other parts of the world, we see uh, this question of this narrative of the deservingness of a beneficiary, a recipient of a state good or service, or of a victim as having um, 
um, as long being sensitive, susceptible to um, people's attitudes towards others, you know, especially with regards to race, um, citizenship uh, status, uh, partisanship, um, and, and other identities. So that's kind of within that area is where this paper um, is coming from. And um, without further ado, I'll start my presentation. So this uh, you can very quickly see is uh, the number of natural disasters over the past, um, uh, what, 40 years. And you can see by type of disaster, um, the, the price tag of the disaster aftermath, right? And so you can very quickly visualize the clear trend, climate disasters, where in recent years we've had record breaking natural disasters that have cost a lot of money, right? In order to, to um, assist um, and repair what has been damaged by either the severe storm or the wildfire, the winter storm, flooding, et cetera. And so in particular, um, if you see the year 2017, that kind of you know, shoots out um, it's a, a record breaking year, and this is the year that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on hurricanes um, that occurred in 2017. So, to zoom in just in the United States in the year 2017, you can see that there were many billion dollar disasters um, occurring over the year and across the country. And the uh, the circles, the bubbles, the size represent the the price tag, um, and then the colors represent or reflect the different types of natural disasters that have occurred. You can see that in Florida that year, and and this has just gotten worse actually after 2017. Um, you have wildfires, right, that are about 10 billion dollars um, in in monies after. Uh, to to repair the damage, right? To um, for relief and um, and assistance after the wildfires. Uh, you see flooding also in California, um, tornadoes, um, drought, severe weather. But then you have at the bottom of the screen and to the screen and to the right, you have these huge circles um, that represent the three big hurricanes of 2017, and I'm sure that you remember them. Uh, the first one, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, Texas um, in August, and it flooded the city. Uh, it was catastrophic flooding, and it was just devastating. This a city uh, where I lived many, many years that is well used to devastating hurricanes and, and, and storms, um, but still Harvey was in a category of its own. Um, and you can see that the price tag is close to $200 billion. And then immediately <clears throat> after that, Hurricane Irma came through the Caribbean um, and then uh, hit uh, Southern Florida, Miami, also catastrophic flooding. Um, it wasn't the biggest one once it hit the U.S., still 65 billion price tag. And then there was the infamous Hurricane Maria who that hit um, um, the island of Puerto Rico, devastating, brought down the whole um, electric grid, um, um, thousands of lives lost, right? Um, just tragedy all around. Again, these are areas of the world that are quite used to, I mean, as much as you can get used to a devastating hurricane hitting you, but they're used to, um, they have seen other hurricanes in the past, but these hurricanes just broke records. So in our, in our um, research and in our, the survey that, actually we have several surveys, but, um, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, our surveys are trying to leverage the high uh, profile of these hurricanes, the salience 
of these particular natural disasters. And, and the connection we feel that people have made in their mind uh, with these hurricanes being part of a broader pattern, so we're leveraging that to ask basically who the American public thinks is deserving of natural disaster help, right, or assistance. Um, and here you can see some images of the devastation of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the catastrophic flooding um, in Houston of Hurricane Harvey. And uh, one of the things that motivated this research and this question of deservingness of who, which victims of natural disasters deserve assistance. And, you know, we would argue that all victims of natural uh, disasters deserve um, assistance. But our motivator was that we saw high levels of, of political partisan rhetoric around this question of who deserves help, of, of the different types of victims, of, um, of, of differentiating victims, and along which lines. Often unspoken, sometimes came out very clearly, it's not going to surprise you that um, one of the most vocal, probably the most vocal voice on this question of who deserves American dollars after a natural disaster hit was uh, former President Trump. Um, and and we, we have in our paper a few tweets to show the type of rhetoric that we're talking about, but especially how the narrative that he built um, and, and, and other Republican leaders built around this question of deservingness and how the Democrats or Democratic voices um, responded to that narrative of deservingness. Uh, tell us that this, this is a, a very salient issue, even, even if maybe as social scientists, as political scientists, we haven't picked up fully on it. So um, you can see here that um, uh, Trump is um, talking about uh, Puerto Rico getting too much money, right, and, and um, more money than others. Um, again, what's implied is that less deserving than others, um, and how now there might be little money left for all these other places, which also you'll notice he mentions Alabama, Iowa, Nebraska, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. You know, these are all um, Republican or, or blue states, right? Or um, at least, yeah, most are blue states and, and fully blue, if not purple, maybe. Um, and then you see a quick uh, response in, in some of these other tweets, you know, with uh, Bernie Sanders and um, and then other liberal uh, voices in, in Twitter um, arguing that Puerto Ricans are also American um, and that they are, as US citizens, which of course they are, um, they are as deserving as any US citizen in Nebraska, Georgia, South Carolina, et cetera. Uh, one of the questions, because because we uh, tackle, we focus on two of the hurricanes. We focus on Hurricane Harvey in Texas and then Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, and because Puerto Rico is an, an independent or an autonomous uh, state, an associated state um, with, with somewhat of uh, too many American, um, Americans on the mainland US might be a status that is not well known. Um, we wanted to know if um, if Puerto Ricans were seen as U.S. citizens or not. And so, because we wanted to know, because this is going to become clear when I talk about my survey experiment where this, this is at play, we wanted to know whether respondents, which come from um, mainland U.S., uh, continental U.S., uh, whether respondents would know that Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens, and if there was any noise around that, you know, could it be 
due to lack of um, of just knowledge, right? They just don't know, um, and 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 it doesn't mean that they are perceived as lesser. So um, we had asked in an earlier survey, we asked uh, the two following questions. One is, uh, is Puerto Rico part of the United States? And if you look across the yes, um, you can see that a vast majority of respondents in all different categories of self-identification um, respond that yes, that Puerto Rico is part of the United States. But then when we ask the same people whether they think that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, across groups, we see a drop of 10 points, 10%. Uh, so even though there's um, knowledge, or there appears to be knowledge in our sample that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, Puerto Ricans, uh, when we ask them, do you think of them as American citizens, we lose 10% across all groups, right? So we thought uh, we, we are on to something because we really are interested in this perception of nationality because it is a major part of this narrative of deservingness, right? Citizens deserve more than non-citizens, legal residents deserve more than undocumented residents and uh, and so on. So we wanted to know, we wanted to have like a measure of, um, of knowledge on this. So our motivation, which I've been talking a little bit about is um, that we understand that what determines how disaster aid is distributed should be need whether people need assistance or not after a natural disaster hit. Um, we see that climate change is increasingly increasing competition for uh, federal disaster assistance. Uh, and we think that public opinion on who gets help, how much they receive and how fast will affect politicians actions, right? So we, we have been bombarded, especially um, under the, during those years around uh, Maria and Harvey, uh, we we were bombarded by what some politicians thought about how much help certain victims should get. But we we wanted to hear what respondents, what U.S. residents and citizens felt. So the question, our research question, is who does the public believe? deserve disaster assistance. And this is part of a, of, of a bigger project, this paper. This paper uses um, survey data from our second survey. Uh, I have another uh, project with um, a, a young colleague, a graduate of the Geographical Sciences uh, Department at UMD. And then um, with uh, Marshevsky, Ross, and Rouse, um, we we fielded uh, actually three uh, continental U.S. surveys with um, a similar um, survey experiment in it. And we have a new one that we, you know, the pandemic hit, and um, you won't be surprised to hear that that kind of put was put to a side. Um, but we actually have. Um, a fourth survey um, that that I'll tell you about a little bit in the conclusion. But um, here we use data from this continental U.S. survey of oversampled Hispanics, um, and it's an online random sample of 1,290 respondents. And it's part of the UMD critical issues that's run by Stella Rouse and Chibli Tohami at the University of Maryland College Park. And so um, we draw from different uh, literatures on environmental justice, welfare deservingness, and state responsiveness. Um, we definitely draw from um, heavily from uh, prior studies that have examined beliefs of deservingness in different areas. Uh, we're interested in Philindra's work on deservingness in immigration. Um, Alicina's uh, a seminal work 
on deservingness and welfare, who should receive welfare um, uh, benefits, um, and also past work on deservingness and disaster. And all of these studies have found that citizens' attitudes towards race and nationality towards the other uh, shape who they think should get assistance, right? So that's one of uh, the body of literature that we um, draw from. Uh, and then environmental justice literature, uh, the, the environmental justice scholarship tells us that government remediation of environmental damages is slower and lower income minority communities. So we're interested in this um, in this comparison between Hurricane Harvey in Texas and um, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, because of that, especially along the lines of nationality perception or perception of nationality or citizenship uh, status. Um, and then we also draw from the literature that looks at how citizens may um, approve or want more of a market-based intervention by the government or direct you know, state intervention in different areas, especially in the environment and social welfare. Um, and then there's also a small but very interesting um, research that looks at how uh, post-disaster management by politicians may have electoral consequences, right? So how governments um, or how the federal state intervenes after a disaster may shape the support of citizens for that government in you know, future elections. So our question is, what determines citizens' judgment of who deserves disaster assistance? And we believe that this deservingness can be determined by, by two, um, two things. One, the type of beneficiary that we're talking about that can vary depending or vary along uh, perceived citizenship status, perceived race, perceived ethnicity. And then uh, the type of assistance, especially if we're talking about more generous intervention, uh, where the state is um, directly transferring resources to the beneficiaries, the recipients, or whether the market as an intermediate mechanism is used to transfer resources for disaster assistance to beneficiaries. And you can see here that the type of intervention uh, we see can be more generous or less generous and more market oriented or less market oriented. And, um, and these are the options that we are going, this is a menu of options, um, really our dependent variable that we have in the survey experiment. So we ask respondents, we give them a vignette, which I'll share in a, in a bit, and then we ask them, what should the government do? Should the government provide funding to buy a house to this victim, a house of similar value to the one they lost? Should the government provide loans to buy uh, a house of similar value? So as a loan, we see that as a market um, mechanism. Should the government subsidize a rental for indefinite time? So that's the government transferring directly resources. Uh, or should the government subsidize a rental for six to 12 months? So we see that as more of a market um, intervention. And then we also give the option of no assistance. <clears throat> and so I talked about this, the survey is from late 2018, oversampling of Hispanics. Um, and we, um, we examine effects of race, immigrant status, gender, partisanship, and different uh, disaster interventions here. And um, of that menu of options that we give the survey respondents in the survey experiment, really we are mirroring um, options that, are, that exist and are offered by FEMA um, when a disaster has been declared, a, fe a federally declared a natural disaster, FEMA is allowed to come in and assist residents uh, for primary, for damage in primary residence 
taxes of these residents. And so basically you have these three categories that you see on the slide. Uh, FEMA may offer temporary housing assistance. FEMA may offer to repair a home or to replace if the home is structurally compromised and, and residents can no longer stay there safely. And this um, residents are um, assisted by FEMA when they are either uninsured and they have to prove this or underinsured, right? So those are eligibility uh, criteria. So our vignette, um, as I said, gives these options and I'm gonna read them to you in the next slide. But uh, what we did was we split the, the sample, uh, the survey in, um, in different samples. Half got Hurricane Harvey, the other half got Hurricane Maria. And then within those halves, we varied the name in equal number, so about 80 respondents got a different name. And these names are um, set to cue the respondent on, on perceived race, perceived um, citizenship status. Um, and so you can see Amy Smith, Connor Smith, Isabel Garcia, or Carmen Soto, Jose Garcia, Ricardo Ramos, and then Shanice Washington, Terrell, Jim Wong and Jane Wong, right? So we're trying to cue um, respondents that the first two are female, male, white victim of one of the two hurricanes, the second female, male, um, Latinx, uh, Latina, Latino victims of these two hurricanes. Then the following two are African-American victims of these hurricanes um, and then Asian-American. And so the vignette is, they, they see the name, right, which will rotate, um, lost her or his house to flooding in either Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Maria and had to relocate from either the city of Houston or the island of Puerto Rico to a nearby city or to the U.S. mainland. So then should the federal government through FEMA provide funding to buy a house of similar value the, the menu of options that I gave you, right? From most generous to least generous, or rather um, not generous at all because there's no assistance. And in a very uh, uh, summarized nutshell, what we find was that um, biases observed on perceived citizenship deservingness, we saw that strongest among whites and white Republicans. Uh, we did not find one of our uh, hypotheses was in group, right, or in and out group. Um, but we were kind of expecting that in group. So especially being that we had an oversampled Hispanic um, survey, we were expecting that maybe Hispanic respondents or Latinx respondents would be more generous towards the, the Latina, Latino, um, and especially those that were victims of Hurricane Maria. And we didn't find that. We did find though, however, that um, Hispanic respondents tended to be more generous across options, but for all victims, not just in-group victims. And so this gives you um, the likelihood of federal government assistance preferences. And uh, these are average, average uh, marginal effects. And in bold, you can see um, the, the ones that are statistically significant. And so I'll just call your attention to a few. You can see that when you have white respondents and a minority disaster victim, uh, the, the option to provide funds to buy a house dropped. Um, right, the, there were very few that chose, that had that as their preference of assistance. Um, and then across the board, Hurricane Maria disaster uh, victims got, from, from all different types of respondents, um, got less uh, support um, for the funds to buy a house, right? 
um, Republicans tended to be um, more inclined towards market uh, interventions like loans to buy a house, less so of, um, of lengthy uh, leases of rentals. Um, one of the items in the survey was whether uh, respondents thought that government was responsible for disaster response and recovery or whether it was the individual's responsibility. And those that answered that it was the government's response, so when responsibility attribution was placed on the government, those people tended to be more in favor of more generous interventions by of, of federal assistance, right, to, um, to disaster victims. And you can see that um, from rent indefinitely and then a high per, higher percentage um, supportive of funds to buy a house. And then we also asked whether you yourself as a respondent would be likely to file a claim with FEMA if you were a victim of a natural disaster. And those that answered yes, also a little bit more likely to support more generous interventions for victims of natural disasters. And then one thing that we were really interested in, because we, we wanted to see the effect of perceived citizenship status um, that was, we could, you know, we could hear the noise in the political climate at large about that. So we had an, um, um, an, a question in the survey of whether both your parents were born in the United States. And that was a really strong predictor. So when both your parents were born in the United States, you tended to be less generous across options, right? Less likely to uh, support, um, especially the more generous ones with regard to the house. Um, and then you'll see, I'll show you another, another finding, another result in a bit with that same, that same uh, label. Um, and then we have some others that you know, we're kind of intrigued. Um, we were expecting a stronger gender effect um, we actually, we thought that maybe um, what, if, the, if the victim were a woman, she would naturally be seen as a little bit more deserving because of certain stereotypes of, you know, of the, the weaker sex versus the stronger one. And so the, the one being a little bit more susceptible to um, and thus deserving to help than the other. But we we didn't find um, we didn't find anything there, um, and we had this weird finding that um, female respondents were much less likely to support the loan um, to buy a house. So um, some of our uh, hypotheses, if you read the paper, found empirical support in our analysis, and others were a little bit more mixed. Um, and here just quickly to show you that white respondents, regardless of hurricane, are <clears throat> more likely to support a loan for the house and much less likely to support buying a house and more likely to, to support um, a, a temporary rental. And um, Republicans, so partisanship was strong too, more likely to offer no support to victims of Hurricane Maria. And then Republicans, um, and is there a question there? I hear some, no, okay. Um, and then Republicans more um, likely to um, be less supportive of buying a home. And then white non-Republicans more likely to support temporary rental for victims of Maria, um, more likely to support a loan to victims of Harvey, less likely to support buying a, a house regardless. Um, so after our survey experiment, we introduced a behavior question immediately after, so in the questionnaire, you know, it's the first question that comes up after the survey experiment. 
So we asked, do you think this year's federal budget should increase spending, decrease spending, or keep spending the same for disaster recovery? We explained that recovery entails rebuilding after a disaster. And the options were increase spending, keep spending the same, decrease spending, or don't know. And uh, because we were particularly interested in, in, um, in whether support for intervention is connected to attitudes towards immigration or perceived citizenship status, we condition respondents on the independent variable, both parents born in the United States. And you can see here <clears throat> the marginal effect of both parents being born um, in the United States on disaster spending that um, you have um, um, reduced spending and um, increased spending, right? That varies depending on non-white hurricane victim versus white hurricane victim. So if the, the victim of uh, the hurricane is has the name that cues as, as Caucasian, then that gets increased spending and more support for increased spending. Um, whereas minority um, or non-white uh, gets less support for that. So when the victim of a hurricane is white, respondents whose parents are both US born citizens support an increase in federal disaster spending. When the victim is non-white, respondents whose parents are both US born citizens do not support increased spending. And the difference is statistically significant between the two. So to conclude and to talk a little bit about what we where we want to take this project, we um, we understand um, that climate change will just continue to increase competition for state disaster assistance, and thus because of that, we think that public opinion is going to be um, very important in determining who gets help, how much they receive, and how fast. Um, we um, we want to know what the conditions are under which we should expect people's biases to shape their perception of deservingness. And we think that this has to be tested in specific policy areas. And we want to see more research on the question of deservingness and and something that we we have been going back and forth on is this question of whether um, certain um, distributive goods from the of government goods and services, are they perceived as insurance or are they perceived as welfare? And there's some you know, seminal research on uh, by uh, Moan and Wallerstein on how support for welfare goods and services will depend fundamentally on whether respondents think of welfare as redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor, or if they think of welfare as insurance. That is that the state as the ultimate you know, insurer steps in against the risks that private insurance markets fail to cover. And we think that especially um, natural disasters are seen, are perceived as um, susceptible of insurance. But because they have become so costly, the assistance, the aftermath, um, we think that we might be at a moment where these perceptions of welfare and insurance may be a little bit mixed. We would expect um, biases of different sorts to shape, um, to have a much stronger effect on perceptions of deservingness by respondents when these respondents are thinking of climate disaster assistance as a welfare handout. And we think that if respondents consider this still as insurance, we should see less of those prejudices you know, filtering in. So to test that, because we, we used to have it more in the paper, and um, as we were presenting it, we, we were told, you need to test this. So in our last survey, 
that we really haven't been able to go in um, too deep. We replicate the survey experiment, but instead of giving the FEMA options as our dependent variable, these different interventions, we give welfare options. So we say, you know, so and so, the same deal, you know, the two hurricanes, uh, they lost their house. Should they receive, you know, direct cash transfers? Should they receive um, Medicaid? Right. And so we have a list of. And in our preliminary analysis of that, we didn't find much different results than what we had already. That is that um, these these are are her are hypotheses of um, in group of hemophily. You know the the that you look to support. You want to support people that are like you, that look like you, that are part of your flock. Um, we we didn't find strong strong empirical support there so we think that maybe climate disasters natural disasters are still considered by respondents even intuitively we're not we're not um arguing here that they you know respondents have thought about this at length but just like what what are their intuitions their reactions that might shape how they who they perceive deserving or more deserving of government assistance, um, that maybe they're still along the lines of insurance. And, and we, we're not really in, um, we're not seeing the full effects of distributed politics here. So we need to get into that a little bit more. We've hesitated, and with this, I'll, I'll, I'll close my presentation and, and welcome your questions and comments. Um, but we've we've hesitated whether to have like two separate papers, which might be a little bit repetitive, or try to bring in this this new uh, survey experiment, which may make the paper too full and too many moving parts. So we're we're slightly at a loss in which strategy to take. So I'll, I'll welcome any comment, um, all your comments, but any comments along those lines in particular would be would be very helpful. Thank you. I can stop share now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Alcaniz. We'll open it up to questions. Anybody have questions? Uh, if I see something in the chat, do you want to speak your question? Well, it, was, it was more a comment than a question, right? So I was wondering if, if in the thinking of the difference between insurance and welfare, you're considering that the way that people call assistance, whether welfare or insurance, also depends on the race and ethnicity and nationality of the recipient, right? So Republicans can see um, a black family that receives food stamps as depending on welfare, but they would not call a white farmer who receives subsidies from the government a welfare recipient, right? Even yeah. though both are distributed programs. That's right. Yeah, so this is what we're trying to get at with our uh, victim profiles, right? With the names. And um, and so we we went back and forth with the names. So this is a thing that if you if you tell respondents, this is a black victim, this is a white victim, they're they're gonna know what's up. And they don't they don't want to come off as racist. Um, so you might not trust those results that much. So we wanted a more subtle way to cue any insider, outsider group uh, belonging. And um, you know these these biases that that exist. One of the things that we've wondered about after the fact, and I think this this happens, you know, if you do survey experiments, this, it is what it is. You can't go back and change it. Once you've done it, once you feel that that's it, you have to deal with what you wrote, and then you're hitting your head. Why did I do this this way? You know, you got to live with it. And you just have to report as honestly as possible in the paper, right? What may be flaws of design. 
And one of the things that we wondered was whether those names are sufficiently strong, a signal of the perceived race and nationality or ethnicity that we want to cue the respondents on. And we feel very confident with the Latinx names, you know, for obvious reasons, in another language. Um, we felt confident with our Asian American profile, um, but we wondered a little bit more um, about the, the white and black victims. So um, one of the things that have come up and we, we, we leaned in on our last survey because we wanted to compare the FEMA options, which we see as clearly insurance, and the welfare options. So we had to do everything the same, but it it we we it's been suggested that maybe moving forward, if we were to um, change the research design, that maybe those names or there could be other ways to cue um, respondents without without prompting them to give us an answer, um, you know, one way or the other. So it's kind of, I don't know if you have any suggestions on, on, uh -huh. yes. So that's absolutely right, yeah. So actually we, we did think about that later. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. So if, if you're not looking at the chat, you know, photos of recipients and, and this has been, those usually are very effective. Um, I'll write that down. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I have a quick question. Uh, and, and please pardon me because I have to jump off soon to give a presentation on disaster research on Puerto Rico. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Isabel. I really enjoyed this this presentation and I find it so fascinating, so well done. Um, I was really interested in just one comment is it's interesting that you don't necessarily find an effect for um, shared ethnicity except for white identity, which I think is interesting given you know what folks like Ashley Jardina argued that you know white identity uh, sentiments are on the rise and that there's sort of a, a, a growing solidarity among uh, folks who identify as white. So um, you do see some effect of co-ethnicity, just not necessarily uh, amongst uh, minorities. So I, I saw that, I thought that was really fascinating. But, and, and another thing that I found fascinating is, uh, so two things, one is we know that the status of Puerto Rico and its residents is complicated. And, you know, regardless of how people answer, whether it is or not, uh, they are or not citizens, there's still doubts. I mean, we see this around debates around whether Puerto Rico should be a state or not. I mean, it's complicated. It's a complicated history. I think there's still a sense of like, you know, to quote uh, uh, a U.S. court uh, decision, Puerto Rico is a uh, foreign in a domestic sense, right? And I, I wonder the extent to which we should examine um, people's feelings of like transnational solidarity in a sense. And I wonder maybe things like asking folks, have they, have they travel, have they have, do they have experience with foreign travel or travel to the site specifically? Um, another thing that, uh, that literature on solidarity has recommended uh, that leads to solidarity is um, I guess shared experience. You have that with folks uh, who had some experience with disasters, but I'm wondering what other kinds of experience, and this may be off, but I, I wonder um, protest participation may breed a, a certain kind of solidarity or political engagement may, may lead to some kind of, of solidarity that spills over into their sentiments on, on disaster resource allocations. Uh, I, I was actually thinking about that, uh, Zoe, exposure to uh, international news, um, you know, who do they consume their news from, things like that. Those would be really interesting. And one last thing is, and I know you, this is done, you know, but for future waves of this experiment, one last thing I was thinking is comparing a uh, disaster that affects a country like Haiti with uh, Puerto Rico. And then you may have um, 
I guess a, a good basis for comparison, um, or not even Puerto Rico, maybe Haiti versus um, uh, victims of the next hurricane season that comes through, uh, the next hurricane that comes to Florida or or, or Texas. So those are uh, some ideas. I love this this paper. Thank you for presenting it. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, I really like your point on white identity. And you know what I realized, and this is typical of projects that you, they start out um, and you think you're gonna wrap them up very quickly and so you focus on the one thing and then it takes a little bit longer and, and you're still in the original uh, frame of mind. So this is why it's so useful to present research. You're absolutely right. Like we, we don't like bring out in full the um the these effects of co uh ethnicity and white identity which are some of the stronger findings that we have so that's incredibly useful um and this is great so thank you and then with regards to transnational solidarity yeah we thought about that uh maybe not in those terms but we actually do ask about shared experience we have a number of questions on mm -hmm. um, whether they, the respondents themselves, have been victims of uh, natural mm -hmm. disasters, whether they have family members, whether they think that their family members may be affected, whether they have family members who um, had um, a protected status immigrating to the United States. So we, we because we were oversampling Hispanics, we created a profile precisely of these transnational ties, right? And um, and no, they didn't have any effect. We, we, were, we were really surprised. Um, but um, I haven't looked into protest participation, political engagement news, and actually we do have several of those. Um, we just, partisanship, because the, the uh, partisanship identity of Republican, um, independent and Democrat, but especially Republican and Democrat was so strong. It's like our strongest predictor, um, or one of the two being white is the other one really. Um, we, we didn't add on to it, but it, it might, it might be interesting. Um, and especially I'm thinking now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll have to talk to my co-authors about this, but I see the potential of going a little bit more in depth on on that profile of political participation, and then to, to try to tease out this white identity, because um, it really resonates with you know the last few months. I mean, really with several years back, but especially with the last few months. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Other questions? I'll jump in. I had one. I was um, curious because you mentioned that um, the Hispanic Latinx um, respondents were more generous across all of the victims and not just within their own group. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that might be driven because they're more aware of the kind of things that are going on in Puerto Rico. So it's um, it's because of exposure to um, kind of past natural disasters or like the aftermath of them that they would um, be more generous overall. Um, and then I think that's kind of related to the question of uh, whether they would think about themselves as relying on FEMA. So it's a kind of a different thing, right? If they would rely on FEMA, then that's something about the, whether they think there's a problem with like the welfare state or something like the, like if, if they would use it, then they think it's like, okay for people to use. Um, so trying to kind of disentangle those, those two questions. Um, and also people who grew up or have ever lived in like Florida or on the Gulf Coast is going to have more direct yeah. experience with the yeah. aftermath of hurricanes looks like. And so that may make them more or less generous. So that question as well might be kind of interesting to um, to examine. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. So we were interested in this um, and uh, um, what makes what might make. Hispanic respondents more um, to stand in, 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 you know, have more empathy towards especially the Puerto Rican victims 
Um, although, you know, if you know anything about Houston, there are lots of, I mean, it's a ma majority minority city by now, um, majority Latin X. But so we had several questions that asked about their respondents personal experience on uh, what I was just telling Fernando, right? Like if they had um, uh, lived through natural disaster themselves, whether their family, we asked them about their homeland, if they had been victims of uh, hurricanes or other natural disasters in their homeland, um, were family members who remained in the homeland, had they been victims? And, and it wasn't, what was interesting was that Hispanics tended to be more generous with state intervention, regardless of whether they had personal experiences or not. So I, we read this in two ways. You know, it could be that there's a network effect of Latinos and Latinas that no matter your personal experience, it's gonna it's gonna have it's gonna shape your views of of perceived um, victimhood, right? Uh, but it could also be that Hispanics, and there's literature that supports this, that um, Latinx tend to be more comfortable with state intervention, um, you know, or with government support. Um, also, there's an overlap with partisanship, right? Less uh, Hispanics are Republican, although they, we, we had a good chunk in our sample, but it was still, there were fewer Republicans than declared Democrats and independents. Um, so Hispanics too lean more liberal. Um, so, you know, you, you have that too. But, but to answer your question, what I thought was really interesting was that Hispanics were more generous on average, regardless of whether they had experience or their families had experience with it. So they, they, there was clearly a network effect, but it was diluted in terms of personal experience. Uh, I have a statistical methodology question and a okay. conceptual question. Um, so, and I'm sorry if I missed this in your analysis, or maybe it's in your in your paper, but maybe not in the presentation. Um, were you able to use any methods that took advantage of the fact that the available choices for level of support can, in some source, be ranked uh, by magnitude? So, I know you, in a footnote it said you did multinomial regression, yeah. but that's still, you know, sort of nominal choices, right? Yeah. And right now I can't remember where there's if there's a tool that allows you to associate an ordinal variable like white versus uh, Hispanic to uh, sorry, that's a nominal variable to one that's ordinal, like the four different levels of support. Yeah. But I'm wondering if somehow you can exploit the fact that, um, you know, not only does choosing one alternative preclude the respondent from choosing another alternative, but, you know, there's some signal and the fact that they went in one direction or the other. Um, and then the more conceptual question was, I'm wondering, what, you know, what's interesting about disastrous assistance is that there's some sort of sense of immediacy, right? And kind of a disaster happened and we need to make some decisions about resource allocation, um, potentially in different ways to different groups uh, and even for different events, depending on when they happen. Um, and I'm wondering if, that aspect makes these kinds of um, uh, differences uh, in terms of uh, sense of deservedness different from, say, measures that uh, are going to help communities prepare for disasters, right? Which is also an important question in the in the presence of climate change. And so, are those allocations different because, you know, in some sense, you aren't reacting to a disaster. Um, but you know, I, I could see it actually being, you know, more uh, equitable or worse, <laughs> uh, yeah. given given that the policies that determine the outcome are fundamentally different. But yeah, um, I feel like this this work has a lot of relevance to those kinds of questions as well. Thank you. Those are really good questions. And actually, on the ordinal ordinal versus nominal, we spent a lot of time. Um, we did run models with it as ordinal. Um, I was. I was running stuff nominal and um, 
and some of my co-authors tried ordinal, but we decided, and we we had somewhat similar results, so it didn't change um, how we how the the, the the model didn't change that much, the choice. Um, but we thought that nominal would be more conservative. Um, that because we can't really, um, we can we can see um, ordered preferences along the least less generous, more generous dimension, but less so in the non um, non market or you know direct government and then market. So because of that dimension that we were interested in in you know being able to to track in full we decided to go nominal and so but that we spent a lot of time on that and i think that maybe um we can have a longer footnote on on that discussion because that question has um come up in 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 a few times um and then with regards to the sense of immediacy that's a really good point um, and we were concerned with the dimension of time and how this affects. We we discussed possible ways of testing for this in, in future surveys. Um, one thing that was suggested to us and that we also were interested in is whether different natural disasters have a different time or at least a different perception of the immediacy, right? Um, so, so we thought about that um, in terms of the natural disaster, but you're specifically talking about it, you know, whether pre or post intervention, right? And so for that, we have that behavior question where we ask, you know, should, um, now it's not fully formulated as preparation, but we're cueing the respondents, given all that we've told you, all this destruction that we just described, and keeping in mind who was most affected, you know, should we prepare for future disasters by spending more money on this, investing more in natural disaster, less or, right? And, and that's where we get that really strong effect of, of, um, of US citizens, couple generations US citizens um, being less interested in what, what, to use your terms, you know, in investing and preparation for the next natural disaster um, when the victim that they got was a minority, you know, a non-white victim. Um, but uh, what I realize now is that we we don't uh, we we have it. A, it's it's it closes the paper. The paper is already very long, and we kind of you know very quickly mention that finding and and not say much more. Um, I think we can we can mine this a little bit more. Um, this distinction between uh, pre and and post. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions from any of the graduate students who are here? You can also feel free to send me a private. Uh, chat if you have a question that you don't want to speak up. In the meantime, I'm looking at, I think I missed some of the of the chat uh, comments, so I'm going through them very quickly. Thanks for all of them. Any other questions? Last call for questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Alkinis, for um, for joining us. Feel free to stick around if you have any um, additional.